Martin Scorsese's Taxi Driver is the story of Travis Bickle, an isolated war veteran who descends into madness before erupting into a violent rage. It's a really dark movie, and in 2005, they almost made a video game about it. But they never did. Just a few months after the title was announced, it was quietly cancelled. It never came out. You will never play it. And for almost 20 years, that was all we knew about this game. That was the full story. Until now. This story begins 10 years after the film's release, way back in 1986, when investment banker and electronics distributor Moore Sutton founded Majesco Sales Incorporated in New Jersey with his sons. Far removed from the industry's beating heart on the West Coast, Sutton was not a gamer, or even like a tech guy. But he was a businessman, and he could recognize opportunity when he saw it. So just as the gaming industry was finally starting to bounce back from the crash of 1983, Sutton correctly guessed that there was nowhere for it to go but up. Now, Majesco didn't have the skills or the resources to be a cutting-edge publisher at this time, so instead the company made its bones in the 80s and 90s by reissuing old handheld titles that had long since been abandoned by their original publishers. By securing exclusive deals to publish Sega and Nintendo's back catalogs, Majesco carved out a comfortable little niche catering to the kids who were still playing on last-gen systems. Sutton summed up his business model in Nintendo, saying, quote, just give me the code and I'll give you a royalty. It was a low-risk, low-reward strategy, but eventually it paid off, and by the end of the 90s, Majesco was able to make the jump to current-generation publishing. In 97, they put out a slate of titles for the then-new Game Boy Color, including Monopoly, Frogger, Battleship, and Pong. And while obviously these still weren't original products, they were reliable sellers, and by the time the Game Boy Advance dropped in 2001, Majesco quickly became its largest third-party supporter, churning out eight licensed titles within a year of the system's release. So it's the early 2000s, and the company is now a major player in handheld publishing, and while this would remain its bread and butter, Majesco was already preparing to make a bid for gaming's top tier, premium AAA console publishing. Their first attempt was 2002's Blood Rain, an action-adventure title developed by Terminal Reality. Blood Rain was pretty derivative. It took its aesthetic cues from games like Wolfenstein, and its gameplay was your typical hack-and-slash stuff. It wasn't bad, but it wasn't terribly original either. It was exactly the sort of thing you'd expect Majesco to publish, because remember, these guys weren't creative visionaries or even gamers themselves. They were businessmen. And businessmen generally don't want to take big risks. But they do generally want to expand, right? And so in 2003, Majesco merged with a failed company called Connective Corp, which allowed them to be publicly traded on Wall Street for the first time. Now, they'd hoped that this would finally give them a shot at the credibility and the capital they need to make it in premium gaming, but having the financial tools to secure investment is not the same thing as actually having investors. And up to that point, Majesco just didn't have the track record to raise that kind of money. You can put Monopoly on the Game Boy, and you can put out a generic slasher title, but that is not enough to get people to actually open their wallets for you. The console publishing world was a crowded place in these days, and Majesco needed something new and something original to show that they even had the business acumen to make it in the big leagues. But the funny thing about being a bottom feeder, the funny thing about building your business on yesterday's hardware is that eventually you learn to spot opportunity where nobody else can see it. TV shows on the go, TV shows on the go, it's G. In early 2004, just as the Game Boy Advance was nearing the end of its lifespan, Majesco had figured out how to put up to 45 minutes of video, with sound, on a standard GBA cartridge. And I know it sounds funny now, but at the time, this felt like revolutionary technology. You could watch SpongeBob in the car. It was unheard of. And pretty much overnight, the company had created a new use and a new market for the Game Boy Advance. So naturally, within just a few months of putting GBA video on store shelves, Majesco's profits had literally quadrupled. These things were printing money, which was just the push the company needed to turn heads and raise capital for its move into primetime AAA publishing. You can also tell they were really feeling themselves at this point, because they changed their stock ticker symbol from MJSE to COOL, which is kind of stupid, but whatever. So they had the means, they had the motive, and now Majesco was searching for opportunities to break into premium publishing. But again, this is not a company of California, Silicon Valley, self-styled visionary types. These guys are East Coast money men. They don't like unnecessary risk, and they certainly didn't get here by breaking new ground creatively. 
From their perspective, the smart move was just to look at what was selling and to pay someone to make that for them. So they did. Action adventures were still big, so they ordered a Blood Rain sequel. Sci-fi shooters were doing well, so they made Advent Rising. People still like platformers, so they published Psychonauts on consoles. By always hedging their bets, by always following in someone else's footsteps, the company hoped to earn a place in gaming's top tier. And in 2005, nobody had bigger footprints than Rockstar. If Majesco wanted to compete, then they were going to need a Grand Theft Auto clone. And if the popular way to make one was to license a classic crime movie, then they were going to do that too. So by 2004, Majesco was shopping around for a studio to develop their GTA knockoff. They were taking pitches from just about every developer that was interested when they sat down for a meeting with Papaya Studio. Based in Southern California, Papaya was a relatively new startup founded by three young, up-and-coming developers. They didn't have much capital, but they had experience, they had contacts in the industry, and they had an actual passion for gaming. You know, pretty much the complete opposite of Majesco. While the Papaya team wasn't totally new to the business, they didn't have much of a portfolio at this point as a company. They'd previously made low-budget titles, including a racing game called Top Gear, a scooter game called World Tour, and... well, that's it. Nothing else. But in the pitch meeting, Papaya showed Majesco a demo that really caught their eye, that something called Outlaw Taxi. Now, this game was apparently really early in the development process, and there aren't many available details. Like, we know the player character would have been a cab driver, and we know that he would have had superpowers, but that's pretty much it. The rest has been lost to time. But for whatever reason, Majesco decided it was exactly what they needed, and they signed a deal with Papaya to turn Outlaw Taxi into a GTA clone based on Martin Scorsese's Taxi Driver. In a 2009 interview, executive producer Dan Kitchen explained, quote, We picked up the game from Papaya and invested approximately two and a half million dollars into the title. Once the game was signed, I immediately reached out to Mark Kaplan at Sony Pictures to secure the rights to the film license. I negotiated a deal and Majesco signed the licensing, making the game an officially licensed taxi driver game. It's pretty obvious why they wanted to license a classic crime movie for their GTA clone. Because everybody else was doing it. Between EA's Godfather adaptation and Vivendi's Scarface, Majesco seemed to be in good company. But but we don't know when or why or how they settled on Taxi Driver as their IP of choice. That's probably something we could only learn from the actual decision makers at Majesco, and none of them have responded to any of my requests for comment over the last year. But there's a few possibilities that I think are most likely. For one, maybe the suits at Majesco had just never seen the movie. Like, if you know nothing about Taxi Driver, it kinda sorta feels like it falls into the same category as these other films, right? It was made by Scorsese, who also did Goodfellas, and it starred Robert De Niro. If that's literally all you know about it, you would probably guess that it was about organized crime, even though it really, really isn't. Another possibility is that it wasn't originally Majesco's idea at all. We know for a fact that with The Godfather, it was Paramount Pictures who asked EA to turn it into a game, not the other way around. Maybe Sony was trying to get in on the adaptation craze and had already been in talks with Majesco before the meeting at Papaya. I don't know, who's to say? Whatever the case, a deal was made, and under the direction of Majesco, the Papaya team got to work turning Outlaw Taxi into Taxi Driver. The basic premise of the story was that the game would serve as a sequel to the movie, that it would begin just after the events of the movie had finished, but more on that to come, I promise. For the actual script, Majesco hired a team of quote-unquote Hollywood writers to draft a story outline, but there were pretty immediate and obvious problems with the work they turned in. It was a mess. It was uh, not even just, oh, this dialogue is bad, but there's, there was no game there. This is Annie Vandermeer, a former Papaya dev who joined the team around August 2004. Now, Annie was cool enough to talk to me about her work on the game, and since she played several roles within the company, she's able to give us a never-before-seen view of the development process. By the time Annie arrived at Papaya, Taxi Driver was still in its infancy. The first mission, part of like a little tiny scrap of the hub, and like the basic character model was working. I think in some builds, they were still using the uh, character model of the previous game that they were working on. But even with so much work ahead of them, Annie said the team at Papaya was hopeful in these early days that the game could come together as something that wasn't terrible. I kind of had a, a, a long sit at the beginning of it to be like, okay, this is rocky ground, but I think there's a way we can make this work. I think there were points when the team was actually kind of excited about it. Still, Majesco's direction on the project was less than helpful, and the Papaya team found itself mostly unable to implement its publisher's demands as development wore on through early 2005. Dealing with Majesco was not an easy thing. I can't be diplomatic, but it was pretty awful. 
But the process moved pretty quickly, and by May, in the run-up to E3, Taxi Driver was announced to the world. Now, the announcement itself was pretty scant. The official word from Majesco is that the game would be a sequel to the movie, and that it would feature an open world with shooting and driving-focused gameplay. They also included these infamous screen caps, which even now are some of the only images of the game that have ever seen the light of day. But almost immediately, the announcement was met with skepticism and real anger from critics in the media. See, while some noted the game as the inevitable consequence of Majesco's ambition, and of the rise of the classic movie game, most media coverage mocked the idea from the jump. The game's would-be peers like The Godfather and Scarface had dealt with some pushback at their announcements, but this adaptation in particular struck the media as a bridge too far. GameSpot even noted that John Hinckley Jr. was inspired by the film in his 1983 attempt to kill President Ronald Reagan. And while they weren't worried about the game inspiring real-life violence or anything stupid like that, they were pointing out that this was a morally complex film with a really heavy legacy, and that it's probably impossible to do it justice with a PS2 sequel. Also, there's not a whole lot documenting this, but around this time, word got back to Martin Scorsese, who, according to the film's screenwriter Paul Schrader, tried to have the project killed. Luckily for Majesco, though, Schrader and Scorsese had signed over, quote, all their rights to all media, known and unknown, now and in the future, back in the mid-70s during the film's production, and so their hands were tied, at least for now. Still, that was the vibe going into E3. Majesco and Papaya were butting heads, Scorsese was trying to pull the plug, and the media had made Taxi Driver the poster boy for the growing backlash to the movie adaptation trend. Things were looking grim and so Majesco knew it had to turn things around with a big showing at the convention. Instead of just playing a trailer at E3, they set up a playable demo for the PS2 and encouraged the public to try the game out, which you can see in this video right here. Now, together with the promotional stills released at announcement and like a 30 second trailer, these three-ish minutes of gameplay are all that we would ever see of this game. Until now. See, Annie was cool enough to share her notes from development with me, which gives us the first ever look at what this title was actually going to be. And so, without further ado, I present to you for the first time, The Taxi Driver Game. So the game would have opened with a tutorial mission set during the shootout at the end of the movie where Travis kills Iris' pimp and everyone else who gets in his way. There are definitely two screenshots of this mission, and probably three, but this last one I'm not so sure about. Flash forward to two months later, and Travis is now dating Betsy. That's the woman who he creeped out in the movie and then sees again at the end. Mission two begins with Travis driving to her place for a date, but when he arrives, he finds out that Betsy's been kidnapped. He kills a few guys at her place, I'm pretty sure that's what we're seeing here, before chasing the kidnappers across rooftops and fire escapes, which we can see in this screenshot. Now at this point, there's a few light puzzles for the player to solve, including quote, switches, ladders, and pushable shelves, Annie says. Now we follow these guys to an ice factory, briefly seen in the trailer right here, and we kill them, but it's too late, Betsy is dead. After this mission, we would have been thrown into the game's open world, which we'll get into later. Mission three begins with Travis trying to figure out what just happened. You know, who killed Betsy and why. He goes to a workplace at the campaign office of Charles Palantine, that's the presidential candidate from the movie that Travis tried to assassinate. When we get to the office, there's some goons trashing the place. They're apparently looking for some mysterious papers. We can see a glimpse of the office right here in the trailer, as well as in these screenshots originally obtained by Mafia Game Videos on YouTube. He's actually got a great piece on this subject, so check that out if you're interested. After that, Travis chases the thugs to another location, which was originally supposed to be a warehouse, where we would apparently drive around in a forklift. You can see that in this screenshot right here. There's a couple other kind of industrial looking screenshots that might show this part of the game, but you know, it's, it's hard to say for sure. Now the warehouse was later changed to sewers because as Annie says, quote, it was the 2000s and how dare anyone not have a sewer level. I'm pretty sure that's what we're seeing right here. Sometime in or around this mission, we would have met two new story characters. There's Frank Danton, a shady mob boss type who offers Travis a job, which he declines. And then there's Constance, a prostitute who works for Danton. Now it's not really clear when or how we learned this, but it turns out Danton is conspiring with Palantine to rig the election. The pair had Constance seduce Palantine's opponent and then took pictures of them to blackmail him. You still with me? So mission four sees Travis go to a pawn shop to drop something off. Uh, we don't know what it is, so it probably doesn't really matter. 
He chases some guy through the pawn shop into a junkyard for some reason where there's this big boss fight. The guy is up in a crane, he's dropping cars on Travis, and the player has to shoot out the engines on the crane in order to force the guy out of his little booth so we could kill him. There's one screenshot that absolutely shows this mission. Um, this one kind of looks like a pawn shop, but I can't say for sure. Now from this point on, I have descriptions of each of the missions and I have a story summary, but it's pretty much impossible to tell how and where these things intersect. I'm gonna do my best, but you know, bear with me. At some point after the junkyard mission, Travis drops Constance off at a hotel. While he's waiting outside, he sees Carl, who is one of Danton's men, and is apparently the guy who took the blackmail photos with Constance. Now, we must have met him earlier in the game because Travis recognizes him and he gives chase. Carl leads Travis into an ambush, but Travis kills everyone. There's a big boss fight with Carl, after which Travis gets the camera that was used to take the blackmail photos. So he takes the camera to go get the pictures developed by Easy Andy. Uh, that's the excitable little manlet who sells him the guns in the movie. At this point, Travis sees the blackmail photos of Constance and Palantine's opponent, and presumably he kind of works out what's going on with all that, but he still doesn't know exactly how Betsy was involved. After that, Travis tries to go meet Danton again, you know, to ask him about the pictures and stuff, but he's stopped by a henchman, uh, some woman named Bittersweet. Bittersweet's guys start a fight with Travis, but of course he kills them. That brings us to mission five, which was gonna be a shootout at a nightclub. Now, is this where Travis chased Carl to and got the camera? Is this where he gets in a fight with Bittersweet's guys? I have no idea. Your guess is as good as mine is. At any rate, this mission is by far the most well-documented part of the game. There's like three to five uninterrupted minutes of gameplay in this nightclub that were recorded at E3, but there's not really anything in this footage to show what's happening in the story or why we're here. Sometime after that, Travis goes home and he calls up Easy Andy again to get the pictures that were on the camera. They arrange a meeting at a warehouse, but of course it's a setup. Andy has betrayed Travis, explaining that Danton is a big customer of his. Now there's a boss fight against an assassin named Ten, but apparently we don't kill him because he, he comes back later on. After this, Travis goes to try to see Constance again, but he's overpowered by her pimp, uh, some guy named Ray Ray and he leaves. This looks like it might be a brothel right here, so maybe this screenshot is from this mission, but I, I couldn't tell you. But by this point, Travis is starting to suspect that Danton was involved with Betsy's murder, and he's quote, going nuts for revenge, according to Annie. With no one else to turn to, he seeks advice from the wizard, his co-worker at the taxi depot. Just like in the movie. Get it? Now we don't know what kind of advice the wizard gave him or how this conversation went, so hopefully it's not very important to the plot. In mission six, Travis would have gone to a um, adult theater and killed the owner, who was apparently also working for Dan. There's a couple of seconds that definitely show this mission in the trailer, as well as some screenshots courtesy of Mafia Game Videos, and this little clip appears to show like a film set with a bed, so I think this might be from the same mission. Later, Travis goes back to the pawn shop from mission four. I guess he's picking back up whatever we dropped off. When he's there, he sees something that belongs to Betsy, and somehow that's enough for him to confirm that Betsy was killed by Danton's assassin, Ten. He also gets into a boss fight with the pawn shop owner, who I guess is a different guy than the one we killed last time we were here. In mission seven, Travis would have returned to the taxi depot to see the wizard again, but he's been killed by Ten, the assassin. There's an ambush, but Travis escapes through the subway tunnels, as we can see in the trailer right here. He also figures out that Ten is going to kill Constance, presumably to wrap up all the loose ends in the blackmail scheme. So we go to the brothel to save her, and we kill Ray Ray the pimp, and finally kill Ten. Now this is probably mission eight, but there's nothing in Annie's notes on that one, so I don't know for sure. After rescuing Constance, Travis gives her money to get out of town and prepares for a final showdown with Danton. Now, mission 9 was going to be a fight in the cemetery, but there aren't any known screenshots or clips of this one, and I'm not really sure where it fits into the story. But it would have brought us to the final mission, where Travis confronts Danton, Easy Andy, and Palantine in a big boss fight that involves a helicopter and would have been in a penthouse at a fancy hotel. As far as I know, there's no clips or screenshots from this mission either. But in the end, Travis kills Danton and the others, but he gets really shot up in the process. The story was gonna end with Travis bleeding out in a gutter. As he smiles, looking up to the sky, dying, Constance walks by, visibly high on drugs, with her arm around some guy. She kept the money, she didn't leave town, and she's back on the streets. The end. Now that's very confusing, and a lot of things aren't really explained, but 
Presumably it would have made a little more sense in the final version of the game. It seems like Betsy found out about the blackmail plot while she was working on the campaign. I guess she was gonna blow the whistle on the whole thing, which is why Danton had her kidnapped and killed, but since we're working with incomplete notes from development, everything else is anyone's guess. Now the game's open world was going to serve as the hub where the player hung out and completed activities in between the missions. The most well-documented part of the open world was going to be this fare driving system. Travis could pick up passengers in his taxi and drive them across the map for money. Some, if not most, of these fares were going to be pretty straightforward, but there were a few unique events too. An IGN reporter who played the game at E3 described one such scenario, quote, I picked up a woman who wanted to be taken to an office building. Her goal, unbeknownst to me, was to shoot up her former employers. Had I made it to the office, she would have hopped out with a gun in hand. I could then chase after her and kill her to stop her from the violence. However, I kicked her out of the cab early, purely by accident. She shot up the cab in retaliation, which is actually some pretty cool AI scripting. Annie shed some more light on this system through her notes, telling me, quote, The passenger events thing was real, and it was interesting, but it took an awful lot of content, and things tended to repeat quite a bit. Story and system constraints kind of made it difficult to make a lot. You had people who would just want to go to a point, some who would and then would leap out of the car without paying and you could beat them up to get your fare, ones who would threaten to shoot you if you didn't take them where they wanted, some who would say they were going to kill someone and if you didn't stop them where you left them, they would, some who would ask to chase a car, etc. It was difficult to get super into it because your fares weren't big and you ended up doing a lot of the same events repeatedly. I know some people who played the game a while would just beat up anyone who they dropped off because then they'd get the money either way. Notably, you could not steal cars. You were stuck with Travis's taxi, and Annie says she doesn't remember there being any street races or anything like that. She told me, quote, As for source material obligations, it actually made the open world conceit really hard to deal with. Think about how often you steal cars in Grand Theft Auto and how necessary it becomes to getting around in the world, or even just collecting new ones. Now you just have a cab. You can only drive that cab. The end. Much less freedom, and we struggled to make it interesting. We know about a few other activities aside from driving the taxi. Like, there's some clips in the trailer that appear to show a shooting range, and since this doesn't come up in the story synopsis, we could probably assume that it was another open world activity. We also know that the open world was going to feature an arcade where you could actually play mini games. Annie explained, quote, There was an arcade put in because Majesco had the rights to some very old games but also our programmers and designers got a chance to make neat little games for it as well. Some were really nifty little mini-games, as I recall, mostly done by character model and developer Dan Doptis and fellow developer and future Discord CEO Jason Citrin. But other than these two activities, and presumably health and ammo, it's not really clear how you would have spent the money that you earned from completing fairs. Weirdly, there were probably no police in the game. Annie doesn't mention any in her notes, and the IGN reporter who played the demo at E3 said he didn't see any either. Instead, if the player shoots or runs over too many civilians, the screen blurs until Travis passes out and you're forced back to your last checkpoint, in a mechanic that was meant to simulate the character's sanity. Annie writes, quote, It's true that you'd eventually black out if you ran over too many civilians. A few here and there, with some time between, because the game was forgiving and because the car control wasn't really great. This did act as a decent conceptual safeguard, not just because we couldn't get civilians lunging perfectly out of the way like in Crazy Taxi, but because that would look super ridiculous. Now according to Mafia game videos, the map would have only included Lower Manhattan and was set to include Union Square, Chelsea, the Meatpacking District, Chinatown, and Little Italy. Majesco had apparently tried pushing the team at Papaya to include more than one open world hub for the player to explore. Presumably this would have included the city's other boroughs, but Annie says that discussions came down to why and also how. Reporters who played the game at E3 noted that the streets felt kind of empty. Maybe this would have been tweaked before release, but as Annie says, there was a concern about making it too hard to avoid hitting pedestrians, so maybe it was going to stay this way. Who knows? Now, the combat appears to have been pretty standard for a third-person shooter of its time, judging from gameplay footage and from descriptions of the people who played it. We know from gameplay clips that there was this basic cover system, but that's kind of it. The only notable thing about combat seems to be something called the rage mechanic. Uh, you would apparently have to complete these weapon-specific button combos when finishing off a wounded enemy to build up your rage meter. Annie says when the meter was full, the game would let you do stuff at different points. I think it was just powerful attacks, I genuinely can't remember what they were. From the gameplay footage, it looks like you just do these little animated finishing moves. It's kinda cool, I guess. These screenshots from the MGV video look like they might have come from the combat tutorial where the player is first introduced to this system, but I don't know. In terms of weaponry, early promotional material mentioned that Travis could acquire a Colt 25, a 44 Magnum, a Mac-10, a shotgun, and an M16. 
There's an Uzi and an AK-47 that are also visible in some of the screenshots, and Travis can even be seen dual wielding in the gameplay footage, which is actually pretty cool for a GTA clone of that time. We also know from E3 reports that Travis moved more slowly when he had a bigger weapon equipped, which is a neat little detail. Games like this often had pretty boring combat, so it's kinda interesting to see the Papaya team was making the effort to keep things lively. Annie told me, quote, There was a sense of progression with the weapons. In the first mission, you just had a 22 and a knife. Second mission, you would get a 38 snub nose. The third, you get a 44 magnum, which could shoot through cover. Enemies always had the good weapons first, though. You kinda learned what they could do by them being used on you, not the other way around. Travis would pop pills to restore his health during combat, which we can see the player pick up in this clip from Mission 5. Just like in the movie. Get it? There were probably no character customization options, even though we can see Travis sporting different haircuts in these different screenshots. For one, he's wearing the same outfit in every image, and two, it turns out that the Mohawk Travis that we see was actually an early character model that was based on Robert De Niro's likeness. But after the complaint from Scorsese, and after months had gone by without Majesco actually securing the rights from De Niro, the Papaya team replaced that model with a placeholder based on developer Dan Doptus, which is what we're seeing in this E3 footage, and I'm pretty sure what we're seeing in the MGV screenshots. We actually get a couple of glimpses of the character model's face, and while it's pretty clearly not De Niro, it doesn't look totally out of place. As for the music, Annie can't quite remember if the actual movie score was going to be in the game, or if they were just going to do something like that. But press releases from May 2005 mention a 70s themed soundtrack, which to me sounds like they couldn't actually get the rights to the film's music. And that's pretty much it. Now, I know it's tempting to view all these new story and gameplay details as a further indictment of the game. Like, it still obviously totally misses the point of the film to an almost obscene degree. Now, that's not particular to this game. Like, a lot of these adaptations will sort of neuter the movie's message to make it work as an action title. But a lot of the script here seems to be actively working against the taxi driver canon. Like, it's significant and it's unambiguous that Travis cannot maintain a relationship with Betsy, or really almost anybody. And yet the game just kind of decides that he can now and we have to accept it. Also, the decision to rework Palantine from a generic politician to like an actually evil criminal is laughably stupid. In the film, Travis is a mostly sympathetic character at the beginning. Like, even if he's kind of weird and angry and isolated, the audience is supposed to relate with him in the first act. And then we watch him go crazy, largely as a result of the alienation that he causes with his own behavior. At the end, when his rampage is misinterpreted as justice and he's hailed as a hero, we the audience know better. This guy is a ticking time bomb and he's going to go off again. It's unsettling. It's supposed to be unsettling. But the game straight up just doesn't acknowledge that nuance. It assumes that Travis is and was a hero for what he did, and we're just supposed to go along with it. We're just supposed to agree that he could be a normal guy with a normal life and a normal relationship, and that doesn't sit right. Now I understand the reason why this game would have been so different from the movie. It's the same reason why they decided to make it a sequel instead of like a real adaptation. Because what's interesting about Travis Bickle is his interior life and the way that he misinterprets his exterior world. That's just not a great subject for a third person shooter. I understand that. You should be able to take some liberties when you're adapting a drama into a video game. I get it. But the script doesn't just tinker with the canon to make things work, it actively undermines the source material for its own ends, and I don't know if I could look past that. I think the first rule of a video game adaptation ought to be, do no harm, and this game 100% fails the test. But if I'm being fair, there are things in here that display some sensitivity, or at least some awareness of the film by the Papaya team. Like, the cab fare side missions where you drive around these homicidal freaks is pretty true to the movie, and the fact that the game would let you impart Travis's own twisted brand of justice by killing them is kind of the same realization that he comes to in the film, even if it presents that vigilantism totally uncritically. I also really like the way the game straight up doesn't allow you to go on killing sprees. The Scarface game does something similar, also in the name of preserving the character's essential nature, but that game hadn't come out yet when Popeye was making this. By preventing you from just indiscriminately killing people, the game was taking away one of the pillars of the GTA genre, all in service of the source material. That was a bold choice, and to me it shows the Papaya team did its best to do right by the movie, given the situation they were put in. 
Even the game's story shows some effort to preserve the feel of Taxi Driver. Like yes, it's ridiculous that this high-stakes thriller with political intrigue and gangland massacres is supposed to be a sequel to the slow-burn character study of the film, but it kind of seems like it's pushed along by Travis's misguided sense of serving justice, of cleaning the scum off the streets or whatever. Even if the game uncritically shows Travis's rage and his violence as being righteous, there's a patina of self-awareness to this story that is only really visible now that we know a little bit more about it, and I think that's worth mentioning when we talk about this game. Like, the story ends with Travis having failed to save Constance, right? She didn't leave town, she kept the money, and she's back on the streets. It's clumsy and it's ham-fisted, and it's a terrible IP to make into a video game, but there is a futility to it all that kinda shows an understanding of Travis Bickle as a tragic character, even if it makes him out to be an uncomplicated hero. If it came out, I don't think this game would have been as fondly remembered as The Godfather or Scarface. I don't even know if it'd be remembered at all. In fact, I think the only reason it's so infamous now is because we never got to see what Majesco and Papaya had in mind. People heard Taxi Driver video game and they expected a full-on shot-for-shot playthrough of the movie. Instead, we would have gotten something totally different. Is it bad? Yeah, it is. But for whatever it's worth, this game was not as bad as it sounded like it was gonna be. So there are still a few accounts online from people who actually played the demo at E3, and while their reactions ranged from morbidly fascinated to totally unimpressed, Annie said that most people who stopped by the Majesco booth that year were genuinely interested in the project. Even some media outlets seemed willing to give the game a chance after they saw the demo. IGN said the build had the makings of a decent action title, and GameSpot praised the mechanics as solid. Most were surprised to see a playable version on display less than two weeks after announcement, and everybody seemed interested in finding out more as development wore on, but unfortunately that would never happen. After E3, the looming problems surrounding production were starting to come to a head. For one, Majesco still hadn't secured the rights to De Niro's likeness, giving Papaya no advice on how to proceed. The team was left to build a game around the gaps caused by Majesco's incompetence. The devs became even more concerned when Majesco called up one day and asked them if the game would still work without the taxi driver license. Annie had to rewrite the whole thing in two days, removing all references to the movie and without changing any assets or level design or pretty much anything but the character model and the dialogue. She actually came up with something that sounds pretty cool, though. Instead of the first mission being a flashback to the movie shootout, the player character would have been a cop who went rogue in pursuit of a kidnapper, but the player would have been fired from the force when the kidnapper turned out to be the son of an influential politician. Betsy was reworked to be the player character's estranged wife, who would have been a newspaper reporter who was killed for trying to expose the whole blackmail scheme. The rest of the game would have played out more or less the same, but that honestly sounds kind of compelling. I would have played that. Still, it was all for nothing, because Majesco called back a week later and said that it could be Taxi Driver again, so yeah. But for a moment after E3, it seemed like the game was still coming together. The level design was mostly complete, and Majesco had finally gotten De Niro on board, at least partially. Producer Dan Kitchen said that the actor had agreed to do limited voiceover for the Travis Bickle character, but it's, it's not clear if he ever gave up the rights to his likeness. Still, from Annie's point of view, even as the game was entering alpha, it was increasingly becoming clear that the project's future was tenuous. And by late 2005, Majesco's troubles were coming into focus, as all of their big-budget gambits were starting to flop. Like, Advent Rising did well on release, but bad reviews and word of mouth brought sales to a halt. Psychonauts did well with critics, but it ended up as more of a niche title, failing to find the mass audience that Majesco needed it to in order to stay afloat. But the death knell didn't come until June 29th, when financial analysts issued a report calling the company vastly overvalued, citing a clear failure to meet sales expectations. Majesco's stock tumbled by 15% in a single week, but that was only the beginning. On July 11th, the company adjusted its expected yearly earnings from $18 million of profits to a $19 million loss. Their CEO was forced to resign, and the company's stock was selling for $3.44 a share, which was half of what it had been trading for at the beginning of the summer. Later that same week, Majesco's shareholders filed a class action lawsuit alleging that the company, quote, recklessly disregarded that their strong growth was unsustainable. According to the legal complaint, Majesco had seriously overestimated how many GBA video cartridges they could sell, and it was relying on these new AAA titles to shore up all the money that they lost. But that didn't work out. 
and by the fall, Majesco was expecting to lose $45 million for the year. Without referencing any specific titles, the company blamed its worsening outlook on the transition to the seventh generation of consoles, which, to be fair, was wreaking havoc across the industry. In September, co-founder Jesse Sutton announced that the company's bid for mainstream success had failed as Majesco was forced into survival mode. He told shareholders, quote, Our strategy now includes pursuing low-risk opportunities in the mobile and online markets. And so the company began its long retreat from premium publishing. In so many words, the dream was dead. Financial analyst Michael Pachter probably said it best. They aren't in the big leagues. They're back in the minors now. The company scrambled for money over the next few months, laying off 20% of their staff and selling everything they owned. The situation was so desperate that Majesco started churning out cheap Blood Rain merch just to shore up some revenue. The games they still had under development were either sold off to other publishers like Ghost Rider, or they were hastily shipped out the door if they were close enough to completion like Jaws. But what about Taxi Driver? The game had entered alpha by this time, and by all accounts it was mostly finished. Why didn't they release this game just to make a quick buck when they needed it? Well, for one, Majesco probably just didn't have the money left to pay the team at Papaya, who had also been counting on this game to keep themselves in business. Papaya was forced to make cuts after getting stiffed by their publisher, and Annie was let go around this time. But the main reason seems to be that they were blackmailed out of it by Martin Scorsese himself, allegedly. Scorsese, of course, had signed away his rights to the movie in the 70s, but he still had a lot of clout in Hollywood, and according to producer Dan Kitchen, that's what finally killed the game. Kitchen said that Sony told him, quote, We received a call from Marty Scorsese today. He's very unhappy with the licensing deal for Taxi Driver. He doesn't want the film to be made into a video game, and if you continue with the game, he'll make sure you never license another title in Hollywood. Kitchen said he hung up the phone and went straight into the office of Jesse Sutton, Majesco's president, and said, quote, Marty doesn't want us to release Taxi Driver. We have to cancel it today. Now, I reached out to Dan to hear more about his call with Sony, but he never got back to me to confirm the details. In any case, Majesco quietly pulled the plug on Taxi Driver in October 2005 and shifted their focus to just avoiding bankruptcy. But they still couldn't pay Papaya, who sued them for breach of contract within the next month. In the end, Majesco used the old divide and conquer strategy to get out of paying the devs the full amount, though. Instead of giving Papaya the $2 million they owed, they offered to give about half a million dollars directly to company president Lin Shen. She took the deal, and her co-founders left Papaya not long after. After the failures of 2005, Majesco would recover somewhat, but it never achieved its former glory. The company found some success making budget titles for more casual audiences, most notably the Cooking Mama series, and they invested heavily in so-called social gaming. That's like Facebook games like Farmville. But it was never enough to put the company back on solid footing, and by the mid-2010s, Majesco was being scrapped and sold for parts. The final blow came in 2016, when a biotech firm purchased the company for its NASDAQ listing, just like Majesco had done to Connective Corp more than a decade before. Reportedly, the buyer was mostly interested in acquiring the company's stock ticker symbol, COOL. That would have been the end, but in 2017, Jesse Sutton bought back the Majesco name and started publishing games again. He quickly sold the brand to some Canadian media conglomerate called LMG, and Majesco today remains a wholly owned subsidiary. They've got a few crappy, low-budget titles for sale on Steam right now, but that's pretty much it. And that's how the story of the Taxi Driver game ends. At the intersection of corporate ambition, Grand Theft Auto's cultural dominance, and the classic movie craze, this game was the centerpiece of Majesco's effort to take over the console publishing world. Instead, the game lived and died before anyone had the chance to really play it. You can look at all these screenshots, and you can watch all five minutes of gameplay, but that is it. The game itself was just lost to time. Or was it? So, thanks to Annie, we know that Taxi Driver was just about finished before everything fell apart. We also know that there were several playable builds of the game floating around in 2005. There's the PS2 demo that was shown at E3, and another copy from later on that Annie remembered showing to her parents. Now, in the lawsuit against Majesco, Papaya won the rights to all the taxi driver assets they created during development. Obviously, they never shipped the game themselves. Maybe they couldn't afford to. Maybe they were afraid of Marty. But we do know that they got to keep everything, including the playable copies of the game. If any of those copies still exist, Papaya has them, which begs the question, where is Papaya now? 
While Wikipedia says they've been defunct since 2013, that does not appear to be true. California state records show that somebody has been filing the paperwork every single year to keep Papaya Studio Corporation legally active, even if they're not making games anymore. Those records also show that Papaya is still officially headquartered at the same Orange County address that they had back in 2005 when they were making the game. If you look up that address now, it's apparently some sort of music school for child prodigies or something. Whatever. But the legal agent for Papaya Studio Corporation, whoever that is, has claimed every year for over a decade that the company is still in there. Now, I'm not delusional enough to think that I could actually track down a copy of this game and play it, but I had to know. Is there still a copy of the demo or the alpha build somewhere in a filing cabinet or a desk drawer in this building? So I called, and I emailed the school. A lot for like a year. And they never answered me until last month. Now, I couldn't record that call because of California's privacy laws, but when I finally got through, I explained the situation as best I could. I told them I was trying to get in touch with Papaya Studio, which was legally headquartered at their address. So they put me on hold for what felt like an hour before they finally came back, and they said, and I quote, Yep, we have no idea what you're talking about. 